Saint Therese of the Little Flower is a very, very famous saint. She's super awesome and so holy, but her parents are actually canonized also. Hello, hello, it's Elizabeth Busby here, the Director of Programs for the Theology of the Body Institute. I'm joined by my little buddy, Blaze, who just wants to be with mom all the time, so he's coming with me to YouTube today. And we, in this video, are going to be talking about the discernment story of Saints Louis and Zelie Martin, the parents of Saint Therese, and what you can learn from this discernment story. So make sure that you like this video, that you click the little notification button so you know when new videos are coming, and that you subscribe to our channel. I love discernment stories. If you have listened to my podcast for any length of time, you know that I love hearing how the Lord worked in people's lives to lead them to the vocation of marriage. And I love telling you that because everyone's story is so different. And I want to give you hope in your own journey that whatever the Lord is doing in your life is something totally beautiful. So I had the idea to do the discernment story of Saints Louis and Zelie Martin because it's their feast day today. Of course, you can watch this whenever you want, but we're dropping this on their feast day. So how fun is it to explore the discernment story of the first ever married couple to be canonized together? So let me give you a little bit of background. So St. Therese of the Little Flower is a very, very famous saint. If you haven't heard about her, I'm sure you will love her if you Google her. She's super awesome and so holy. But her parents are actually canonized also, which is just the coolest thing ever. I love thinking about their family life. I love thinking about what it was like to be raised in a home with saints raising saints. Like, it's just so fun. So they're excellent, wonderful people, worthy of imitation. Let me give you a little bit of background about their story. So Louis Martin, he wanted to enter religious life. He wanted to join the Augustinian monks of St. Bernard, and he was very convinced that this was what God had, had for his life. However, he had a hard time mastering Latin, and so the order wouldn't accept him. So he was rejected. This was what he thought God wanted him to do with his life. But instead, the Lord said, no, I have something else for you. So he went on to become a watchmaker, which was a trade that would earn him a good living. I think he figured that if he was going to raise a family, he wanted to be able to raise them well. So he became a watchmaker, and then he set about living this life that a lot of people say, when I did research, a lot of people say that it was almost like monastic in the lay sense of the word, like he just went to to work and he went to mass every day. He had this community of people that he did life with um, and lived in community with, but he didn't really pursue the marriage vocation other than just opening himself to what God had for him in his future. Then we have Zelie. Her last name was Guerin. I actually don't speak French, so I don't know how to pronounce that. Marie Azélie Guérin Martin. And she also wanted to become a religious. Her older sister was a nun in the visitation order, and she was convinced that that was what God had for her too. So she wanted to go join this order, but her health was really poor. She had respiratory issues, and so the order would not accept her. So she also found herself in a situation where she wanted to be religious. She wanted to give her life to the Lord, and that was not what God had for her. So she went on to learn the trade of lace making. Um, Alençon, again, if you speak French, you'll know how to pronounce these words better than me, but Alençon, the place where she lived, was known for its famous lace. And so she just became really good at creating this lace and she started a business and she had other people working under her um, to create this beautiful lace and sell it. We have these two people who wanted to give their life to the Lord in religious life and whom the Lord said no to. One day, this is like out of a fairy tale, but this is really what happened. One day they are walking over a bridge in opposite directions, a bridge in their town of Alençon, and they pass each other. Louis, the, the stories say that Zelie sees this man walking towards her. He's tall, he's handsome. She doesn't know him. They'd lived in separate parts of the town, so they didn't know each other. And she hears the Lord tell her, this is the one I have for you. Louis did not have... It, we're, we're not told about any sort of revelation from the Lord in that moment, but we are told that he did notice this pretty woman. And I like to imagine what it was like for the two of them to cross paths. Did they look back behind their shoulder to look at each other? I don't know. It's so romantic and wonderful. But as Providence would have it, Lewis's mom was taking lace classes with Zelie Martin, and she liked to play the matchmaker, which I can appreciate because I also like to play the matchmaker. And she decided to set her son up with this woman who was teaching these lace classes. And lo and behold, it was the couple that had met, well, they didn't even meet. They crossed on this bridge and they'd passed each other then. After three months of engagement, from the time when they were connected from his mom to the time when they were married, three months, they got married in a secret ceremony at midnight at the church in their parish. And it was lit by candles. I like to think of these candles that they had lit really inspiring or kind of maybe personifying this desire to be a light for the world. 
And as we know, their marriage set the world on fire through the saint, the, through the fruit of their union, which was the saint, the greatest saint of modern times, Saint Therese. So they got married in this tiny little um, ceremony at midnight by candlelight, and then they went on to live as brother and sister for the first year of their marriage because they thought that the best way to give glory to God was to live as celibates. That's both. That's what they both wanted. So they thought, well, we're in our vocation now, but we're going to go ahead and keep living this way. It wasn't until they got the advice of a spiritual director that that was not God's design for marriage, that they should come together as husband and wife and be open to raising children that they did. They went on to have nine children. Four of them died in infancy. Um, Infant mortality was a much bigger deal in the 1800s, as I'm sure you have heard. Um, And four of their children died, one at seven weeks, two of them before their first year. All right, you guys, I had to take a recess and put this on because Blaze wanted to talk to you, but that is not helpful. But they went on to have nine children. Four of them did not survive to adulthood. So she buried four children, but her remaining five daughters went on to all become nuns. All of them, which is just astonishing. Zelly went on to die of breast cancer in her 40s, and Lewis went on to raise the children by himself. Lewis Martin actually went on to develop some pretty intense mental health issues, and because there wasn't a lot of treatment options back in the day, he actually was put into effectively an insane asylum for three years. We can see Therese writing about this in her diary. She calls him her king, and she talks about the agony and the humiliation that her king went through those three years when he wasn't able to care for himself and he needed that mental health help. So there's just such a beautiful, when you look back on their lives, Lewis and Zelly, you see so much beauty. But if you actually press in a little deeper, you see so much suffering. And the reason, well, I wanted to tell you about them because they are so holy and beautiful and the first ever married couple to be canonized together, which is significant. But I also wanted to tell you about them because their discernment story has a very powerful lesson for us. So I want you to think with me, what it would have been like about three weeks after each of them were told that they couldn't enter their respective religious communities, okay? So it's been three weeks. The sting has worn off. They have effectively come to terms with the fact that this isn't what God has for them. They've started, they've had space to start making steps toward their future, toward the careers that they're eventually going to end up undertaking. But I wonder, you know, around that, like, a few weeks after they got this news, I wonder if when all the logistics were taken care of, if they were left with this place in their heart where they were like, Lord, I wanted to give you everything. What could be more holy than being a a celibate to give my life to you in religious life, right? To, To devote my life to prayer and service. What could be more holy than that? How could you not want me in that space? Um, how, I feel like this is something that so many people struggle with. So I feel okay kind of placing this on them because this is a very normal human reaction to disappointment, right? Lord, what could you want from me instead? How many of you are either there right now or have been there in the past? How many of you have had that feeling where you think, Lord, this is what I thought I wanted and it's a good thing. How could you not be wanting that good thing for me? And we have two choices in that moment. We can completely despair. Um, we can, you know, basically use other things other than God to cope, to try to fill that void. We can turn our backs on God. You know, we can go into this place of, okay, Lord, you're doing this, but maybe you don't know best and you cling to pride and you try to figure out how you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps and move on. Or you can do what Lewis and Zelly did and you can surrender to divine providence and you can say, Lord, I do not understand. I do not understand what you are doing right now. I do not understand what you're doing in my vocational journey. I do not understand why you wouldn't accept this yes that I want to give you, but I have hope and faith and trust that something good is going to come out of this. Can you imagine the church in the modern world without St. Therese. This woman has literally set the world on fire with her tiny, simple yes. I like to think that she learned some of these principles of her simplicity, her yes to the present moment. Um, You know, when the nun ahead of her is singing in a tune, or I don't remember exactly what she was doing, but she was making some noise that irritated Therese during prayers. And Therese was like, okay, I'm going to offer this up to the Lord. Or she was working in the kitchens or the laundry and she got water splashed on her. And instead of complaining, she just offered that to the Lord. I wonder how much of that she learned at Lewis and Zelly's knee, right? She grew up in this holy family and she learned these things about how to live life and how to give glory to God in the simplicity of the moment. And then she went on to tell the world that and become this great saint. 
what if Lewis and Sally had just rejected the Lord and gone on to find another religious community that would accept them, or they just weren't willing to say yes to the Lord and, and be open to the pursuit of marriage. They just didn't believe marriage could make you holy. The world would be not as awesome. In a sense, the church would be lacking this incredibly beautiful spirituality, this youngest doctor of the church spirituality that was given to us because of Lewis and Zelie's yes. You guys, don't give up hope. I just, I wish I could sit down with each and every one of you in my living room with a cup of tea and tell you this, but YouTube's gonna have to suffice. Um, I want you to know not to give up hope. If the Lord is not answering your prayer in the way that you want him to, if the Lord is not calling you to the vocation that you think you want, if the Lord is is doing something that you feel like is confusing and you don't know how he's going to make something good and beautiful out of it, I want you to pray to Lewis and Zelie because surely they experienced that moment um, in those years between when they were rejected from the communities they wanted and when they met each other. I don't think I said this. Lewis was... 35 and Zelie was 27 when they got married. And this was in 1800s France. <laughs> like that was not the norm to get married at that point in your life. But they were faithful to the Lord. They waited on him and he set the world on fire because of their yes. And if you are willing to give your yes to the Lord in this space that feels confusing, in this longing for something that isn't coming true, in the timing that you want, have faith because the Lord can set the world on fire with your yes too. Oh, one more thing I wanted to say. This is basically, these are the letters from Lewis and Zelie and they are basically St. Zelie's mom blog <laughs> from the 1800s. This has blessed me so much. If you are looking for something fun to read or something that you are, um, that will give you an insight into what it looked like to be kind of a no normal, ordinary person, but living an extraordinary life, this mom blog of St. Sally Martin is what I, I want to offer you. So it's called The Call to Deeper Love by Lewis and Sally. Until next time, stay close to the heart of Jesus and be not afraid. Bye. <laughs>